Hello from Birmingham. This is going to be a bit of a different video for me for a couple reasons. First of all, this is a personal video. My husband Ian is here on a bit of a pilgrimage, a bit of a family history tour. So we're going to be going to some special locations that are relevant to his ancestors. Secondly, this video will not just be a one day vlog of our visit to the city. It's actually going to be a combination of three different trips. We're here today in 2023, and we came twice in 2022 with our sons to two different areas of Birmingham. So I'll be combining footage of all of those things to show you not only some of the major sites and landmarks in Birmingham, but also some special places to us. And of course, it's a Magenta Otter Travels video, so there will be some yummy food involved as well. But first, let me provide some linkage between last week's family history blog of Herefordshire and Worcestershire and this week's video. 300 years ago, Ian's ancestors lived in Herefordshire and Worcestershire in the beautiful, tranquil countryside. We don't know for sure what their occupations were back then, but it is likely they farmed land or did other types of manual labor. We do know from census records 200 years ago that many of the men were agricultural laborers in Herefordshire and neighboring counties. Some were also in service as footmen or gardeners. And one female ancestor, Eliza Callow in Cradley, was a gloveress, meaning a female glove maker. Ellen Hodges, who we will discuss later in this video as she marries Percival Callow, was descended from a bricklayer in Worcestershire and a lime merchant laborer in Herefordshire. Then the Industrial Revolution provided more economic opportunities in urban centers for these ancestors. So in the second half of the 19th century, we see a migration of these family lines to Birmingham. By 1881, Thomas Sandland was a jeweler's chaser. And after that, he was a stay and corset maker. His son Richard Sandlin was a jewelry journeyman, and Louis Lupson was a dye sinker. And Percival Callow, who I mentioned earlier, was a carter for a hardware merchant. I learned a lot of old terms for occupations researching for this video. So let's proceed with the tour, starting with a bit of sustenance to begin our journey. Speaking of yummy food, one thing that I love eating from street vendors in Britain is falafel because I never get the chance to eat that in Texas. And I recently discovered that there is a delicious magenta condiment available at many of these falafel vendors, pickled turnips. They are beautiful and tasty. It's interesting to see this sign because it mentions so many places that Ian had ancestors living in. Smethwick, Bearwood, Edgebaston, Harborn. So we're about to explore them all. But first, since it's a sunny hot afternoon, Ian thinks he needs ice cream. Oh my goodness. Gelato pops, interesting. Oh, those, those pink ones are pretty. There's your lolly, and then you choose your six sauce. Got milk chocolate, dark chocolate, white chocolate. Got strawberry, orange, and matcha. Okay, and then you choose sprinkles. Wow. With milk chocolate and nuts on top. That's what Ian's getting. And a strawberry drizzle just to be extra. Thank you. Here's my raspberry lolly. Going in the milk chocolate. Getting the nuts and crushed Kit Kat. And then let's drizzle a little dark chocolate on dark that. Dark chocolate, certainly. So what do you think about your ice lolly? It's amazing. LA pops all the way, really good. The finished gelato pops were not only very pretty, but also tasty and cool refreshment as we walked to our first family history destination, St. George Parish Church in Edgebaston. Well, this is the risk of just impromptu stopping by places, unannounced and unplanned. Sometimes they're locked. So first we went to St. George's Church in Edgebaston, which is where Ian's father's parents were married in 1940. But sadly, it was locked, tight as a drum. We tried the church office, all the doors, even tried calling the church office, but no joy. 
and the building looked beautiful the stained glass looked beautiful the rose window looked beautiful so i really wanted to see inside that one so instead of going inside we just took some video and photos from the outside of the church and got a photo of ian in front of it but stay tuned to the end of this video where we get a second chance to see inside this remarkable church for now we are headed on to our next stop which is in harborn at st peter's parish church even though it's really overgrown, this churchyard cemetery is just kind of beautiful and atmospheric. The church is really pretty. I love the stone. And now after a really slow, extremely hot bus ride, <laughs> we've made it to Harborn and we're here at St. Peter's Church and it is another beautiful church that I would love to see inside. This is a church where Ian's ancestors, Thomas and Alice, were married in 1873. But unfortunately, uh, this church is totally locked up as well. So we should have been calling in advance and seeing if we could get into these churches. But you know what? We're going to make the best of it. We're going to walk through the beautiful churchyard. We're going to take photos of Ian in front of the churches, and that's the next best thing. The clock is still telling the right time. It's a little before four. Next, we are headed to Ladywood to visit the parish church of St. John's and St. Peter's. This is pretty cool here at St. John's and St. Peter's Church in Ladywood. They've got a tagline like mine. Do something kind today. Another beautiful church on the outside with what appears to be some great stained glass windows that we will not be able to see from the inside because it's locked. My great-grandmother and my great-grandfather were married in this church in 1906 and unfortunately my great-grandfather only lived until he was 35. He caught some sort of disease like Legionnaire's disease in the Boer War and, um, and died a, a little while after that. And his wife, Ellen, tried going to Canada, but it wasn't for her, so she came back and she ended up dying in Hansworth in 1949. Yeah. I love the detail around the windows and the doors of these little stone faces. And in our family, we're big fans of doing this. Next on our journey, we are going to an area south of Hansworth known as Winston Green. We have been walking miles and miles today and riding lots and lots of buses, getting all over Birmingham, looking for these family history locations. It's been worth it, but it's been really hot. <laughs> so Ian's great grandfather that got married in that church I just showed you, this is where he lived when he got married and we know that from looking on the marriage license it's not a very posh and bougie neighborhood it's not now and it certainly wasn't then very working class neighborhood so there's this gorgeous church at the end of the street but they didn't get married here either because it wasn't built yet, or it wasn't a Church of England church. Currently, it is a Seventh-day Adventist church, but I don't know its history. Now we head to Hansworth to see where Ian's father grew up, long before he moved to Jamaica, where Ian was born, and then to California, where Ian grew up. We're around the Hansworth area, getting a totally different perspective on the canal. Juxtaposition of old pretty buildings and new rubbish looking buildings. It's fun to see how some of these buildings have been restored and just 
the detailing. Here we are walking down another street and looking for another house where his ancestor lived. This is the house where Ian's father lived when he was growing up here in Hansworth. I'll show you more of the area around St. Martin's Church in next week's vlog of Birmingham's Bullring area, but I'm including the church in this family history video because it's a big, lovely old church in the heart of Birmingham. And since it's the original parish church of Birmingham, and even though the current church was built in 1873, it replaced a 13th century church in the same spot. So I'm convinced that some of Ian's ancestors must have been christened here. Let me give you a little insight into how my brain works. When I see a beautiful old doorway like this on a church, my first thought is, what a lovely old door. Look at the old wood and the beautiful hardware. And then my second thought is, can I get someone to pose next to those cast stone faces for me? Thankfully, Trent was with me and he is a fun loving and cooperative travel companion. We are finally getting to see the inside of St. Martin's Church after coming here so many times and only seeing the outside. This is a very wide set of organ pipes, kind of very imposing and I love the stained glass behind the altar. The window was made after the Second World War because St. Martin's Church was bombed in 1941 and the original Victorian stained glass was shattered. The theme of the window is healing. The window itself is a kind of healing, a restoration, and it depicts eight of Christ's miracles. This alabaster sculpture behind the altar was a gift from the Freemasons in 1874 when the building was completed. There are a lot of monuments and memorials in the church, but I will highlight just these. They are members of the de Birmingham family, lords of the manor who lived in a moated manor house nearby and over 400 years brought Birmingham from being the poorest manor in Warwickshire to a thriving market town. Peter de Birmingham set up the first market here when he was granted a charter by King Henry II in 1166. His descendant William built a church here in 1290. His monument is the oldest in Birmingham, dating back to 1325. His legs are shown crossed above the knee, symbolizing that he fought in two crusades. And this alabaster monument is from 1390 and it is attributed to Sir John de Birmingham. This window is my favorite part of St. Martin's Church here in Birmingham, and I actually like this church better than the cathedral. This window has a fascinating history. It is the work of renowned artist Edward Byrne Jones and the famous designer William Morris. It was installed in 1874, and it is one of the earliest works of these pre-Raphaelite masters. The lower panes represent scenes from Christ's life, and above that are images of Old Testament prophets. And at the top, in the center, is Christ, and the four evangelists on either side, with angels at the very top above that. This window was nearly destroyed in 1941. The bishop was desperately concerned about keeping the window safe during World War II air raids, and he ordered it to be removed and placed in safekeeping. The very night it was taken down, a bomb was dropped destroying all other windows, but allowing this masterpiece to be successfully transported to the cellar of the College of Arts and Crafts until it was safely reinstalled after the war. Well, we are in luck. After visiting all of those closed churches yesterday, we got a call this morning from one of the churches where Ian's grandparents were married, and they have an open day this morning. So we're gonna hop on a bus and dash over there and look around inside the church, I'm so excited. It was actually the biggest church of the ones we saw yesterday. And from looking at the windows from the outside, it looks like they might have some great stained glass. So looking forward to seeing where Ian's grandparents were married in 1940. It was so exciting to see the doors wide open and be able to go inside. St. George's Church was first established in 1838. It's one of the largest and well-regarded church buildings in Birmingham. 
The church is so large because the population of Edgbaston grew from less than 2,000 to over 22,000 between 1801 and 1881. Building of the church was funded by a legacy from Samuel Wheely, who left 500 pounds of his estate for the building of a church here when he died in 1831. The church was expanded and renovated for the 50th anniversary, and several new stained glass windows were added. I assume that's when the stunning Victorian mosaic tiles on the floor leading up to the altar were also installed. I personally love the stained glass here, as well as the Gothic window shapes. The windows above the altar are lovely, as is the intricately carved wooden reredos. I was impressed with the alabaster and stone pulpit, as well as the brass eagle lectern. I had to get a photo of Ian with them just to think of his ancestors getting married in this spot. This is the most famous stained glass window in the church here in the Lady Chapel. It was done by a man named Kemp who was renowned for his abilities with stained glass in the mid 19th century. Continuing the tour of the stained glass above the font are my favorite windows including the fantastic rose window that I saw from outside and was so anxious to see from this side. We had to stick with tradition and get a photo of Ian next to this font as well, just like we did at all the ancestral villages we visited in Herefordshire and Worcestershire in last week's video. I hope you enjoyed this special video of Birmingham. Next, I recommend that you watch this review of the amazing lunch we had in Birmingham or this video of our family history tour of Herefordshire. Thank you so much for watching and do something good in the world today.